Good afternoon. I'm Ross Chait, a professor of political science and public policy. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2012 Micklejohn Lecture. The Micklejohn Lecture is a tradition at Brown. It is an almost annual public event created to examine and celebrate freedom under the Constitution. It has welcomed a range of speakers from the inaugural address by Justin William o Justice William O. Douglas, Earl Warren has delivered it, Antonin Scalia has delivered it, uh, former Solicitor General Ken Starr, who has a master's degree in political science from Brown, uh, delivered it. Um, and uh, the lectureship was endowed by New York philanthropist Louis Schweizer in honor of the memory of distinguished educator and civil libertarian Alexander Micklejohn. We hear the name Micklejohn here all the time with Micklejohn advisors, and, and I want to make sure that you do have some sense of who he is. Um, he had very close connections to Brown. He grew up in Pawtucket. He attended Brown as an undergrad. He became a professor in the philosophy department. He later became a dean and then went on to be president of Amherst College. And then he was founder of an experimental college at the University of Wisconsin. Um, as a scholar, Micklejohn is best known for his defense of the First Amendment. He is a founding member of the ACLU in the 1950s. Uh, and his metaphor for speech was not the marketplace of ideas, but the town meeting. To tolerate speech, including subversive speech and speech that may pose other dangers, he wrote, is to face up to the ideas, to be fearless, unflinching, and self-reliant in the pursuit of our shared beliefs and interests. Fittingly, he assigned the Supreme Court a pedagogical role. It is our foremost teacher, Micklejohn wrote. It is, in the last resort, the accredited interpreter to us of our own intentions. Our distinguished speaker today, I think, is ideally suited to deliver this lecture. And I've asked um, Professor Calabrese to introduce him, because he's his friend and colleague. I think um, some of you are students of Professor Calabrese. If you're not, he's a professor of law at Northwestern. Uh, and we have been really privileged and honored to have him as a visitor in the political science department for several years. And we hope that continues for many years to come. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Calabrese. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to welcome Michael McConnell to Brown University for our annual Micklejohn Lecture. Um, I think Michael is one of the most distinguished and successful constitutional scholars and litigators in the United States today. He is an excellent writer, an excellent scholar, an excellent teacher, an excellent litigator, and an excellent friend. I've known Michael for more than 30 years now, and I can't think of anyone else who's done more to transform the way we think, think about the Constitution. Michael's writing on religion, on freedom of speech, and on Brown v. Board of Education has forever changed our understanding of those areas of law. On a personal level, I have many happy memories of time spent with Michael, particularly a trip to the former Soviet Union in 1991 where we stayed at a hotel with no hot water and went to a grocery store with no groceries. <laughs> <laughs> I should say something about Michael's many scholarly accomplishments. Michael is the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's the author of numerous articles and a co-author of two case books as well as co-editor of a book, Christian Perspectives on Legal Thought, uh, published by Yale University Press. And since 1996, he's been a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Michael had an illustrious career before joining the Stanford Law faculty. He served as a circuit judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Um, Prior to that, he was the Presidential Professor of Law at the University of Utah, and before that, the William Graham Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. He's also taught six times uh, as a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, and he is a former law clerk of Chief Judge J. Skelly Wright, 
and Justice William J. Brennan, Jr. Uh, it's a great honor to welcome Michael to Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. He, uh, uh, the, I, I, the mention of our uh, time together in the Soviet Union makes me smile. So many odd things happened. This, he didn't tell you that this was literally 10 days before the fall of the Soviet Union. You remember when the, when the tanks came in and Yeltsin rescued Gorbachev and so forth? That was happened. I'd like to say we were so prescient that we saw all these developments in the wind when we were there. No, not at all. It just seemed like a completely failed totalitarian state when we were there. But the high point was when we got uh, locked in a museum because we were there after the closing hours, and instead of getting people out, they just locked the doors, and we we were trying to get out, and uh, uh, I can't even remember how we did get out eventually. It was really a little scary. Uh, um, I, I guess there now is a movie about being stuck in the museum at, all night long, but at the time we thought we were it had never happened to anybody before. Uh, I am very honored to be uh, here, especially because uh, of, of, the, of the fact that this is the Micklejohn Lecture, of course, in the field of the First Amendment. There are few, if any, maybe no names as distinguished uh, as uh, his, and for, uh, for a scholar to uh, still dominate a field you know, so many years uh, later is, uh, is an enormous tribute, and I feel honored to be uh, uh, speaking in his uh, uh, memory. I, I feel even more honored, though, that there's so many of you out here on this uh, <laughs> night, and so, because I know how, <laughs> I know what it's out there, what it's like out there, and for you to trudge through the, uh, through the storm uh, to be here, I, I really appreciate. Um, what I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, this evening, I call the architecture of the First Amendment. Uh, uh, based upon its grammar and its words and a little bit about its historical context. So I'm not going to be talking about any Supreme Court cases or any cases at all, for that matter. Uh, all I'm going to do is invite you to look with me at the amendment itself and see how much we can figure out about what it means uh, and what it's intended to accomplish uh, through nothing other than just looking at, uh, at it. Uh, and I don't usually do PowerPoints. I think it's boring to have the uh, speaker's words up there. And, uh, but I, the reason we have a PowerPoint uh, tonight is because I wanted to make sure everybody can see the words that we're going to be talking about. And the, uh, it's not long, but there's an awful lot packed in uh, uh, to this. So Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Supreme Court lore about the First Amendment, when I think, I think you'll uh, realize, or you, you would agree with me, that the Supreme Court has really never paid very much attention to the text of the amendment. Um, they refer to the majestic generalities of the amendment. They sometimes give a kind of hand wave to uh, history at a very sort of romantic level of, of you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, idea of untrammeled free expression and attributing this to the founders and so forth. But they don't actually look very carefully at what they did and what is, uh, is revealed by it. <clears throat> Maybe that's because we're not going to get much out of it, but that'll, you'll be the judge of that by the end of the evening. I think that we can learn a lot about it uh, just by uh, looking at it carefully. Um, and so what I'd like to do is begin with its, uh, basically its grammar, its sentence structure. Uh, and, the, and the key uh, point uh, to, to look at is the punctuation. So what you see is there are a number of commas. It's all one sentence, but uh, there are two semicolons, which makes it effectively three sentences, right? Three full, complete ideas. Um, and you can see and all of them introduced by this phrase, Congress shall make no law. But first, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, that is obviously a grammatical unit. 
That is not, we can tell, we don't have to know anything more about uh, the matter than just the way it is phrased to know those are not two unrelated rights. How do we know that? Because the word religion appears once, establishment of religion, free, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Thereof means of religion. We're talking about exactly the same thing, uh, which might make us suspicious of the popular notion that the two clauses are in tension or at war with each other. Right? They, uh, at least grammatically, they're not at tension or at war. They are a, a, a unity. And it should make us even more suspicious of the argument sometimes made that we ought to give the idea of religion a very broad construction for purposes of free exercise, including various secular forms of conscience, right? Uh, 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 but give it a very narrow interpretation for purpose of establishment because we certainly wouldn't want to prohibit the government from being able to formally uh, espouse and act according to any kind of secular conscience or any kind of morality. That would be sort of crazy. And yet, there's only one word. It's only repeated once. The idea that you give two different definitions is, uh, is I think, uh, uh, questionable. And so it seems to me that what we ought to learn from that is that we need to con come up with a construction of the two parts of, this, uh, of the religion clauses uh, that makes sense of it with one unified meaning and not with, uh, uh, not with meanings that uh, require different definitions or that point in different directions. So th the second part, uh, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press is obviously a unit as well. And so here we're talking about most obviously the spoken word and the written word. Right? And we'll talk more about uh, those, uh, uh, that part of it uh, uh, in a moment. And then finally, the right of the people uh, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the petition and assembly are set off quite distinctly from uh, speech and, pr and, and press. Right now, <clears throat> most of the time the Supreme Court now uh, speaks in terms of freedom of expression uh, and doesn't disaggregate among these various uh, uh, provisions. But whoever wrote this text obviously did disaggregate. What is different about petition and assembly than about uh, uh, speech and press, right? Well, we know a little bit about what's different because in a pre-democratic society like Britain from which we came and maybe even uh, the early years of the American Republic, uh, the way in which uh, persons who are excluded from the political world, they did not have the right to vote, for example, the way they could influence and participate in the political process was through petition and assembly. Uh, we know that because the right of, the, of petition was specifically extended in the texts of the day to all subjects in Britain or and the earliest legal text ever to mention the right of petition, at least to my knowledge, the 1641 Body of Liberties of the Massachusetts Colony, it goes so far to say, as to say that everyone has the right to petition free or unfree and even, and even foreigners. They use the word foreigners. So you don't need to be a citizen. You don't need to be a white male property owning voter. You, you don't even need to be a free person. You can be a slave and you still have the right to petition uh, under uh, uh, in, in this right. Not so much so assembly, but there is still a connection because petitions are not just things that individual people write. It's not like a letter to the, your congressman, a pallid, you know, 21st century uh, uh, a version of the right to petition. That's not, what they would do is they would circulate the petitions and get hundreds, sometimes thousands of signatures, right? The uh, um, 
the uh, James Madison's famous memorial and remonstrance uh, 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 against uh, the uh, Patrick Henry's establishment of religion bill garnered, what, 3,000 some odd signatures. And there was another one in the same controversy that garners three times that number. This was the way, when they didn't have Gallup polls, this was the way you registered widespread public support for a proposition, was by having lots of signatures on your petition, or by having lots of people at your rally. So that's why petition and assembly are connected, is because they both have to do with masses of people expressing their views collectively uh, uh, to the government. Right. Speech and press, not so much so. Right? Uh, a, a lonely author like John Milton or Thomas Paine um, may be exercising freedom of the press by publishing the Areopagitica or Common Sense or, or whatever it, it happens to be. Um, and they may, that may be enormously influential. Lots of people may read it. They may be persuaded by it. But it is not a way of registering mass public opinion in a way that the rulers will have to sit up and take notice. That's not what speech and press are all about. But that is what petition and assembly are all about, is ways of, gener of, of expressing mass uh, public opinion outside of the ordinary channels of Republican government by non-voters by everybody, including foreigners, although I'm not so sure about foreigners for assembly, but foreigners for petition, right, uh, maybe. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, and so th this was politics for common people prior to modern democratic or republican forms of government. So, so it makes sense to have those together. So we see three clumpings of rights that are not the same. They have quite different uh, uh, orientation uh, uh, to them. So we can see that by looking at the semicolons. Right. Um, well, what's next? Let's look at the subject. This is, after all, one sentence, and it has a single subject. And the subject is Congress. Congress shall make no law with respect to uh, uh, any of these uh, um, matters. Well, that's a little puzzling, isn't it? Uh, does free speech and freedom of religion and these things, is it only protected against Congress? What if the executive uh, invades freedom of speech? What if a court issues an injunction, which we might well consider to be a, uh, a prior restraint, as the court, lower court was asked to do in the, uh, in the United States against New York Times, the, the Pentagon Papers case. Right? Does, does the First Amendment really only protect us against uh, uh, Congress? And there's a, an interesting implication, if that is so, um, if that is so, the only thing Congress does is it makes laws. It doesn't enforce them. It doesn't throw people in jail. It doesn't uh, do anything to them, right? All it does is pass laws. And uh, one current scholar, Professor Nicholas Rosencrantz, uh, argues that this word tells us that the only legitimate challenges under the First Amendment or what we, we lawyers call facial challenges to statutes. That is to say, uh, if you can go into court and say this statute is unconstitutional, that's a legitimate thing. But you cannot go into court and bring what we call an as-applied challenge. That is to say, it's perf the statute's perfectly OK, but the way they're using it against me, that's not OK. That is, I think, that's what he says is an implication of the existence of this word. I don't agree with that. Um, I think that that might be so if all if this was the only text that we have, um, but it's not. <clears throat> Congress shall make no law, but we also have the due process clause. And what does the due process clause say? No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property. And, and, and note, that's what happens when laws are applied by the executive or the courts, is that they're, they're thrown in jail, or they're fined, or they're, 
uh, they're regulated, or, or the, the, the due process clause is all about what the other branches of government can do to you, right? Um, and they can't do it to you. They can't do any of that to you except with due process of law. Well, what is law? Law is defined in the Supremacy Clause. It includes the Constitution, but most importantly, it includes statutes passed by Congress. This means that neither the executive nor the courts can do these things to you, except when author oops, I'm sorry, uh, except when authorized uh, by a statute passed by Congress, because the Constitution doesn't doesn't do that. So. If, and, and so put the two things together, and the due process clause says nothing can be done to you uh, that deprives you of life, liberty, or property except pursuant to law, and the, first, and the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law doing these various things, put those two together, and voila, all three branches of government are prohibited from uh, infringing the rights that are listed in the First Amendment. And it is not so that you can only bring a facial challenge to the law. You're perfectly entitled to challenge executive or other action which deprives you in the particular case of life, liberty, or property when it is done supposedly according to uh, law which violates the, uh, uh, the First Amendment. So as applied challenges are perfectly uh, legitimate, I think, when you look just at the words and the grammar of, and the subject of, uh, of the First Amendment. But that still leaves the states, right? Because Congress can make no law, but the states are not prohibited from making any law uh, having to do with uh, free speech or freedom of religion or any of these things. And uh, the due process clause does apply. There's a due process clause that applies to the states. It says, nor, nor shall any state, not only is the federal government and the executive and the judiciary not going to able to take away your life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but states can't either, right? But there's such a thing as state law. What if a state legislature passes a law that infringes one of these rights? There's nothing in the due process clause which is going to, uh, uh, which, which creates this, uh, uh, the, this, this, this effect. And so, you know, this suggests to me that the Supreme Court is wrong when it says that the First Amendment applies to the states because of the due process clause. It doesn't. I mean, it is true that the due process clause applies, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, there's no provision that says no state shall make any law doing it, or, or is there? Because there's another portion of the 14th Amendment which does just that. No state shall make any law, right? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now you'll have to take it on faith just a moment that among the privileges and immunities, oops, I'm sorry, of the of citizens of the United States are the rights that are set forth in the Bill of Rights. I think that's linguistically perfectly plausible. If we had a long time on this, there's actually historical evidence going both ways, but at the time of the framing of the 14th Amendment, there were, um, there's substantial evidence even if not you know, beyond a reasonable doubt evidence that indeed the rights of the Bill of Rights were understood to be privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. Uh, and if so, no state shall make any law abridging them. Note that it's the same verb as in the First Amendment, abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Uh, so states can't do it either. And so then the Due Process Clause kicks in and you cannot, uh, the executive and the judiciary of the states also are prohibited from uh, enforcing uh, uh, laws which, uh, which violate your uh, constitutional freedoms. <clears throat> well, that was the subject. What about the verbs? Let's look at the verbs and see what we might pick up from them. Uh, there are three verbs. They're all in this gerund form, but I don't think 
uh, that matters. Uh, uh, at least I don't see any significance in that. But there are three different verbs, um, laws respecting the establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging. Note, by the way, that this, is, this clumps, the verbs clump the rights in a slightly different way than the semicolons did. Right? Um, so what do we make of this? Let's begin with the most uh, obvious, which is with respect to speech, press, assembly, and petition, they cannot abridge the right. Now, what does abridge mean? It means to reduce, to diminish, to curtail something that was previously existing. What we know from the use of the verb abridge is that whoever wrote this text believed that these were previously existing freedoms. Right? The First Amendment does not create the freedom of speech. If anyone ever asks you the question, where does freedom of speech come from, I don't know quite what the answer is to that. Uh, might even be God. But whatever the answer to that is, the wrong answer is the First Amendment. Because the First Amendment itself says uh, that what Congress can't do is abridge it. It already existed. So these are previously existing rights of some sort, which also tells me, and I think it would tell anyone who's actually looking carefully at the words, that we must have a historical understanding of these rights, that the very language of the, uh, of the amendment drives us to ask the question, well, what was the freedom of speech that, uh, that was being preserved, right? So uh, there are lots of arguments about whether the, the place of history and constitutional interpretation and originalism and so forth, and lots of good arguments on one side uh, or the other. Uh, usually people say, well, but the Constitution doesn't tell us how it's, doesn't give us any instructions as to how it is supposed to be interpreted, and by and large, I think that's true. But it's not true here. Here we know from the very text of the amendment that there is a historical element to it because the rights are not to be abridged, so we have to know what the rights are uh, up below that. Note <clears throat> that that is not so of religion. Prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and that is, should come as no surprise because there was no established legal right of the free exercise of religion before. It didn't exist. At this point in time, you did not have the right to practice, the full right to practice any religion in Britain other than uh, to practice in the Church of England. Now, there was an act of toleration which said we will not punish you if you publicly uh, uh, act in worship in basically Trinitarian Protestant uh, uh, churches, but it was not until the 1830s and really in uh, the, the 1830s that the Jews and Catholics got the full right to exercise their religion in Britain. It's not really until the 1870s that a more generalized understanding of uh, free exercise of religion uh, comes into uh, uh, British law. The framers of the First Amendment, whoever wrote this text, wanted us to read it carefully, and they wanted us to notice that we are making a change in this country. We are not just doing the stuff that has done before with respect to religion. Right? We are going to be a new kind of republic, one in which people have the right to free exercise of the religion in accordance with their own uh, conscience and convictions and not uh, according to an establishment. I haven't gotten to the establishment yet, but the two things are very closely uh, related. Note also that <clears throat> the, um, uh, the rights here are referred to as abridging freedoms. So you have a freedom or a liberty as a kind of a legal construct. Right? The freedom of speech doesn't mean speech. Right? The freedom of speech is a legal right you have to engage in speech. Not so the free exercise of religion. It doesn't say prohibiting or diminishing the freedom of religion. It says the exercise of religion. The exercise of religion is actually doing it, 
right? Putting, putting your religion into, uh, 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 into effect. So you have a much more direct, it's the First Amendment is not, a, uh, the re free exercise clause is not about preserving freedom's legal construct, it's about liberating people to be able to exercise their religion without, uh, uh, without legal uh, uh, constraint. It's like the difference if, you, if somebody said, um, you know, the Congress can pass no law uh, prohibiting the eating of ice cream. That means you can eat ice cream, right? If they pass something that says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of eating ice cream, you don't really know whether you can eat ice cream or not. You'd have to find out what the freedom of eating ice cream was, and you know that whatever that is, it can't get any worse. But uh, you know, but uh, you know, they're, 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 you, you don't know. So the, the, the so the grammar here is is really quite uh, different. What the respecting is even odder, right? So, what does the word respecting mean? I think the Supreme Court has has uh, said all kinds of odd things about this and has never really gotten to the, uh, to the heart of the question um, because, I mean, one thing you need to know just as historical context is at, at this time, roughly half of the states had establishments of religion of one sort or another. Every state that had a Bill of Rights, which is roughly 11 of them, protected the, some version of the free exercise of religion. So we had, the, at the time, there was a real prospect of what one might call a non-coercive or tolerant establishment. This would be a system in which the state has formal support and encouragement for either one church or a group of churches, right? But doesn't punish people who don't belong to it, doesn't punish you if you exercise your religion somewhere else. So it's a, it's a non-coercive and tolerant establishment. Roughly half of the states at this point in time had something like that, and roughly the other half had, neither establish, had, had no establishments uh, at all. Uh, and so they were a little sensitive in, uh, uh, in New York where the, in the, at the Capitol about what the imp impact of the First Amendment might be on their homegrown establishments. They didn't want, and, and every objection to, the, to Madison's draft of the religion clauses on the floor of the Congress takes the form of, is this going to injure religion? Is this going to uh, upset the, uh, uh, our establishments? And Madison said, no, that's not what I want to do. All I want to make sure is we don't have a national establishment. And ultimately, the reason they adopt the word respecting is that means at the national level, Congress, remember we're talking only at the national level, isn't going to pass a law establishing religion, but it also can't pass a law disestablishing religion. It's going to keep its cotton-picking hands off of the question of establishment. This is a federalism provision which leaves the question of establishment of religion to the states. And that's what we, you, you pick up from the word respecting. It is a deliberate choice of a word which goes both ways. Now you may say, well, can we do that now? The 14th Amendment is the thing that takes away from the states the power to establish religion. If anything does, I think, it, I think the 14th Amendment does, but nothing in this text uh, uh, does that. So what else can we uh, look at in this amendment? Well, <clears throat> there's a definite article which I think is really quite interesting. Uh, it's abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, and by the way, also the right. This, this I think, uh, reinforces the point about, uh, about the pre-existing character of, of the freedom, because it doesn't say abridging freedom of speech, which would be an abstraction. Abridging freedom of speech might mean we have a philosophical idea of sort of what's ontologically necessary of freedom of speech. Some, you know, and we might look to, you know, people like Micklejohn and Ronald Dworkin and folks like that to tell us what is really necessary. What 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 is freedom of speech? This is the definite article tells us we're talking about the freedom of speech. It's something concrete. It's something you can look up in the book. So it it, it reinforces the idea of. Uh, 
uh, of a historical uh, uh, connotation uh, uh, to all of this, which then brings me then to the question of what was, what were the freedoms we were looking at before, and did we learn anything from that? And for that, I'm going to look to a slightly different text, one that I think most of us have forgotten, but they certainly had not forgotten it uh, back at the time of our founding, which is the English Bill of Rights. You might well think, you know, we've got a Bill of Rights. Where do they get the idea of a Bill of Rights? Well, this is where they get it from. Intermediate to that are the various state bills of rights, which were adopted in state constitutions between independence and, uh, uh, and the adoption of the Constitution. English Bill of Rights, there are two parts of it. Uh, this is, it's much longer than this, but I'm, I've uh, brought uh, two of the provisions, which is uh, <clears throat> the right of the, it is the right of the subjects to petition the king and all commitments and prosecutions for pit such petitioning are illegal. Right. Um, several things, things that are interesting about that. Who has the right? It's the subjects who have the right. Who are the subjects of the king? It's not just the people in the political class who have a right to vote for parliament. Right? At this time in English history, I don't have the numbers in my notes, but it is less than 10% of the adult white male population is entitled to vote. The, the British uh, parliamentary system was not, it was a kind of an, an aristocratic or commercial republic. It was not what we would call a democracy, right? Uh, it was a limited monar monarchy, not a democracy. But all of the subjects uh, have the right to petition the king, uh, and they can't be punished for it. This is, abs this is the oldest of all of the ideas that are now in the First Amendment, is the idea of petition. And it comes, when I say it comes close to being absolute, you, if, if you uh, committed seditious libel in the form of a petition, you would not be punished for it, even though seditious libel is a criminal uh, offense. So petitioning is nearly absolute. I won't go into the th reasons why it's not absolutely absolute. It th doesn't really matter here. But it's a nearly absolute right, and it belongs to all of the subjects. Um, note it's the right to petition the king. What about petitioning parliament? Well, it's actually the king you're supposed to be petitioning. And that led to an interesting question. Well, what if Parliament wants to uh, punish you because you've insulted Parliament in your petition? Uh, Parliament actually, between the adoption of, these, of this text and 1702, Parliament tries to punish two different groups of people for petitioning in ways that show contempt of Congress, I'm not of Congress, of, of Parliament, uh, and they are acquitted, and after 1702, never again. So. Uh, uh, the right of petition then is quite absolute. It also has a connotation then that we somewhat lose, which is you are entitled to an answer to your petition. Um, it doesn't mean the answer was going to be yes. It often wasn't. But you're entitled to an answer. And so the practice in the Congress of the United States was uh, petitions would be assigned to, as they would come in, they'd be given to the committee that uh, you know that had jurisdiction over their particular matter, and the committee would report back as to whether some action should be taken uh, or not. <clears throat> this gives the ordinary people uh, the same kind of right to bring put something on the agenda that a member of the body itself had, which I think is kind of an interesting idea, right? So you have the you have your members of parliament or your, or your senators or congressmen, and they can introduce bills. But common people, in a sense, have a, they, they, when they introduce bills, they can get buried too. The answer to them is, is not always yes. It's going to be referred to a committee. It's not that much different from a petition. And so the power to instigate or initiate change is, uh, uh, is uh, given to, uh, uh, to, to the ordinary people. Uh, well, 
what about in speech? Well, this is, uh, I think this is interesting. The freedom of speech is mentioned in the bill, in the English Bill of Rights. But look who has the speech. It's freedom of speech and debate or proceedings in Parliament. So the freedom of speech in British law at this time is not the freedom of everybody to speak. The only mention of freedom of speech in these you know, official documents are uh, the right of parliamentarians to be able to say what they want within the High Court of Parliament. This means that the king is not going to be able to punish a member of parliament for saying something contumacious. Right. <clears throat> Note how petition and assembly, or I'm sorry, petition and speech are here connected because in both cases, people who are performing in a sense parliamentary roles, common people petitioning, members of parliament introducing bills or making speeches on the, on the floor of the parliament, in both cases you can, you can bring up what you want and say what you want without being punished for it. That's what these two provisions uh, 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 actually uh, uh, mean. Um, so uh, petition then is the, uh, uh, is the oldest. Um, and then finally, um, what about this prepositional phrase? I think in some ways this is the oddest thing in the whole First Amendment because it's the right of the people to assemble or petition. Uh, it's not the right of the, the people. The freedom of speech and of the press is not limited to the people. Now you might ask what difference does it make who else other than people are able to speak or print but what does the people mean? Uh, Professor Akhil Amar of Yale Law School takes the position that the word people is a reference to popular sovereignty, as in we the people of the United States, the very first words of the, of the Constitution, and thus it means the political community, the, the, people, the people are the political body of, you know, the, the people have a right to be part of the politics of the nation, um, I think that has to be wrong. Right? I, think, I think what we've seen already indicates that that has to be wrong because the very point of petition and assembly is that it's a, a, a wider group than that. Back in 1641, the Puritans in Massachusetts even said foreigners. Right? Now, maybe that's going too far. Maybe that's sort of the, the Puritans could get a little uh, democratically uh, uh, crazy sometimes. Uh, the English Bill of Rights says the rights of the subjects, and maybe what, our fr what the fr writers of this text did is that they took the English Bill of Rights and they said, well, subjects, we're not subjects anymore in America. What are we going to call ourselves? The word citizens doesn't become very popular as a term until a little bit later. I think the French Revolution brings, uh, brings the word more into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, a common use. Uh, I think the word of the people is, uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, it might be the, the, the substitute uh, uh, for that. Um, but what it also may be doing is emphasizing the, col the collective nature of this. So the people, that doesn't mean, the, the people doesn't mean the same thing as individuals or persons, right? People are, that's, a, that's a, uh, a one of these words which it's like flock or, or herd or gaggle. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a collect, it's a singular but collective uh, noun. So the suggestion here is that maybe it's protect, it's, it's emphasizing the size, I mean, the fact that it can be lots and lots of people, not just lonely authors in their garrets, but actual uh, groups of people coming out. And that makes a lot of sense when you know what they are objecting to, which were limitations on these freedoms. Uh, and in, uh, it, it so happens that in 1648 and then reenacted in 1661, uh, a statute in Britain limited, it made it a crime to collect more than 20 signatures on a petition. You can sort of guess why that would be, right? They didn't want to have mass petitions. So limit on 20, on, on 20. 
we're not going to have that. It's, if it's the right of the people to petition, that means the whole people can petition. And it's not something that's going to be limited to small numbers. The right of assembly was even more strictly limited. If you had more than 12, you were in danger of being declared an unlawful assembly, something which is very well known to our, um, to our founders and even mentioned very obliquely in, uh, on the floor of Congress as they're debating this very uh, uh, text because the um, uh, Theodore Sedgwick of Massachusetts objects to the draft of the First Amendment saying that it is a, a trifling uh, to include all of these different rights within the First Amendment. And he singles out assembly. And he says, and I quote, um, uh, he says, it is a self-evident unalienable right which the people possess. It is certainly a thing which would never be called into question. Uh, he says, uh, um, if you've if you've, uh, if you've given people a, a, a freedom of speech, well, if people, um, then now I'm quoting Sedgwick, if people freely converse together, they must assemble for that purpose. So he's saying this follows, if you're protecting speech, assembly follows from it. We don't need to, uh, to spell it out. Um, I think this is interesting because in a way this is exactly what the modern Supreme Court has done is it has glommed, it has taken all of these various separately enumerated rights and treated them all as aspects of freedom of speech and as derivative from uh, uh, freedom of speech. But he's answered by John Page of Virginia. Um, uh, well, well, actually, I, I left out the, the, Sedgwick then starts making jokes. I mean, he's a good politician. He can be a little funny. And he says, if we're going to enumerate all these various things, he says, they might as well have declared that a man should have a right to wear his hat if he pleased or that he might get up when he pleases and go to bed when he thinks proper, right? Uh, which is kind of witty. Um, Page of Virginia stands up and he disagrees with Sedgwick and he says, he says that you know Sedgwick supposes that that this clause is no more essential than whether a man has a right to wear his hat or not. But let me observe to him that such rights have been opposed and a man has been obliged to put off his hat when he appeared before the face of authority. And then he goes on to say we need to be careful about rights. Anybody here know who this man is that Page is referring to about who was punished for wearing his hat? Because everybody back in 17, I know Professor Wood knows the answer to this, but I wonder if is this a completely forgotten yes? George Fox. <laughs> um, why do you guess George Fox? Uh, the Quaker. Uh, You're very close. Who's another Quaker? Uh, William, Penn. William Penn. It's William Penn, and it is because he's a Quaker. And what Page is referring to obliquely, note that the word P William Penn's name isn't mentioned. Everybody in the room knows this story, though. Uh, we've forgotten it, but I want to mention it. I'll give you a very short version because I'm running out of time. But. Um, because there is no free exercise of religion, uh, Quaker, you, you, it was not lawful to have Quaker services, although most of the time the authorities looked the other way. But William Penn was going to address a Quaker religious service on Gracious Street in London, and the authorities padlocked the meeting house so that they couldn't do it. So what does he do? He has a meeting out on the street on, in London, uh, so in order to exercise his religion, he has he they have an assembly, right? They assemble with hundreds of people. He makes a speech at this uh, uh, to them, and he is arrested for unlawful assembly. The jury, I mean, uh, refuses to convict him in an act of what has to be understood as jury nullification because the judge instructs them that having found the fact that he did this speech, he was therefore guilty. So the jury uh, acquits. Uh, the jury is then held in contempt of court 
which leads to the leading case on the, on the independence of the jury. This, case, this story is so rich, has almost every provision of the Bill of Rights in this one story. So the jury, the, that conviction is, lay, is overturned, establishing that juries are independent and may come to verdicts even uh, contrary to the instructions of the judges. The judge is so infuriated that he, as the defendant, Penn, is called in, uh, he knows Penn is a Quaker. Quakers don't, don't doff their hats as a sign of uh, respect for authority because you have only, God is the only authority. We don't do that sort of thing for mere uh, uh, human beings. So Penn, very wisely, doesn't wear a, a hat to court because when the judge comes in, he doesn't, he's not going to, that way he, he avoids the problem of, uh, of not taking off his hat in respect for the judge. Judge orders the bailiff to take a hat. Penn comes in. Bailiff puts the hat on Penn's head. Judge comes in. Penn doesn't take it off because of his Quaker conviction. So the judge holds him in contempt of court. And he doesn't pay the fine, and he's sent to jail. So the judge wins, right? But Paige remembers, and everybody else remembers, that, that let me observe that a man has been obliged to pull off his hat when he appeared before the face of authority. And, the, and it's such a perfect story because it's all in defense of the right of assembly, which is the way the whole thing uh, uh, started. Uh, and so what, what Page has done is he has helped us to understand why it is so important that uh, that these individual rights be enumerated because they are not the same. Sure, they are related, but the emphasis of each and every one of them is uh, is slightly uh, uh, the same. So, um, <clears throat> just I'm, I'll, I'll go quickly through the final point. Uh, so, what about the history here? Uh, the right of petition is the oldest, and it's not to be abridged. The rights of religion are the newest and they're not to be prohibited, right? Um, the right of press is the second oldest. It's much more dangerous than speech from the gov point of view of the government. I mean, if we speak together orally, I can only a few people can hear. If I didn't have the microphone on, the people in the back probably wouldn't be hearing now, and this is really an assembly anyway and not, and not just uh, speech. But, but uh, speech is not very dangerous. The press, now that's dangerous because hundreds and thousands of copies of things like Thomas Paine's Common Sense can be, uh, 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 can be distributed, and that can really undermine the uh, government's ability to be able to, uh, to control public opinion. So when the printing, when Gutenberg uh, um, has his invention and William Caxton brings it to England, the king immediately licenses, re requires a license for the owning of a printing press. This meant that you had to go before the board of censors as a printer and justify what you're printing, and that meant that uh, there would be no seditious materials and no heretical or blasphemous or pornographic or whatever materials uh, to be uh, to be done, right? Uh, so there was no freedom of the press in Britain until the Licensing Act, Act lapsed in 1695. They did not, it, it had had a certain period of time, a sunset provision. It lapses, it is hotly debated, and partly because of the persuasion of John Milton not re reenacted, it is the lapsing of the, of the Licensing Act which creates the freedom of the press in Britain. But that is still a long time ago. That's almost 100 years before, uh, before the founding. So, so press is very, has been established and is vigorously uh, believed in, uh, in on this side of the Atlantic. Um, speech is actually not such a big deal. Sorry, Alexander Micklejohn. Uh, but speech did not matter very much. If you look at the 11 state constitutions uh, that protect various uh, First Amendment rights, um, all of them, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, nine of the 11 protect press expressly, five of the 11 protect petition expressly, only one even mentions speech. 
At the Constitutional Convention, several people say we need to protect some important liberties. Press is always mentioned, speech is not mentioned. Even Madison, the author of the First Amendment, when he, when he presents his two uh, uh, amendments, actually one of them uh, doesn't even mention speech. It protects press uh, and religion, but he leaves out speech. It's added by the committee, but uh, it, speech is just not, a, uh, is not such a big deal. Press is the big deal. It's press that all of the uh, anti-federalists are complaining. Press and religion are the rights that they are really uh, complaining need to be protected. And partly this is true because there are specific laws in Britain that they are protecting against with respect to every one of these First Amendment rights except speech. So there is an establishment of religion through the Unif uh, Uniformity Acts. There are, is an attack on free exercise of religion through the penal laws. There is a licensing act until 1695. There are these laws restricting petitions to 20, uh, uh, to 20 people, and there are numerous laws that prohibit uh, the, the right of assembly. Right? There isn't an anti-speech law. It is true that some generally applicable laws, like seditious libel, have, can be applied or, or, uh, to, uh, uh, to speech, but there isn't an anti-speech law and the, the message of all of this is that they really didn't, speech was secondary. They didn't really have a clear theory about exactly what it was that they were interested in. It was, it was press, petition, assembly that really mattered uh, 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 to them. But one last thought about this, and this is, this is not my thought. This is James Madison's thought, but I'd like to bring it to you because I, I, I think it makes a great deal of sense. Um, if you... Uh, if we go back here to the right of speech, again, is the right of the meetings in Parliament. Well, under British constitutional theory, sovereignty was vested in the King and Parliament. That is, um, it is Parliament with the King that is the sovereign. They are the ultimate uh, uh, authority. Uh, in America, who is the sovereign? We believe in popular sovereignty. It's we the people. It's the people who have the right to ordain and establish the Constitution. It's the people who are the ultimate sovereign. Not the rulers, but the sovereign is the people. And maybe here's what's go what happened uh, uh, at the time of the founding, that uh, the British had established the principle that the sovereign gets to talk to itself uh, without having somebody punish them for it. I mean, how could, how, you can't limit, if, the, if Parliament really is sovereign, it makes no sense to say that, um, that, what they're, that when they're sharing ideas and deliberating that they can be punished for it. Okay, well, now we're sovereign. Now the people are sovereign. It doesn't make any sense to say that we can be punished for sharing ideas and for saying things either. Right? And so this is the point, the point that Madison makes in his uh, Virginia Resolutions Against the, the Sedition Act. He says we have to understand, you know, the freedom of speech, he says, is a, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting, he says it is a previously existing right, it is a freedom, and it was restricted in Britain. We need to understand that America's different the thing that makes, if when you understand republicanism and the principles of republicanism, which means sovereignty of the people, then what was uh, a right of the parliamentarians under the English system becomes a right of all Americans uh, uh, to speak. I think you get a lot out of it when you actually read the words and look at the punctuation. So thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so we have um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. We can take questions. There are two microphones. If you just line up with the microphones, we'll do from both sides. Judge, uh, you certainly illustrated that you can get a lot out of it. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, this may seem like a small point, but when you looked at the subject and went from Congress then closed the loop to all three branches of the federal government, and then brought the states into it. I forget, how do we close the loop for towns and local government? 
Uh, in American constitutional theory, uh, towns and local governments are a uh, creature of the state. Um, that is, uh, we have two levels of government, and, this, and the cities, towns, counties are, are subordinate units of, uh, of state government. Some New Englanders find that hard to understand because it doesn't quite describe the constitutional history of places like uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island and, and, and Massachusetts, but uh, nonetheless. Well, if you look at the U.S. Constitution, cities are nowhere mentioned. It's all states. Uh, and then you look at state constitutions, and they all have uh, statutes that say something. You, you, the Cities and Government Act, which is uh, which will be the source of authority. So if you ask, you know, how does Providence get the right to uh, uh, to uh, collect uh, parking fees? Ultimately, that's going to be a matter of state law. <coughs> mm -hmm. Judge, you spoke about the pre-existing right to freedom of speech that the uh, First Amendment does not create that, it just protects it. I'm wondering, do you think that then uh, there would be a freedom of speech, or at least a legally enforceable or legally recognizable freedom of speech uh, if the First Amendment had never been ratified? And if so, are there any implications uh, of that uh, toward, uh, <coughs> toward Ninth Amendment unenumerated rights? My, that's a great question. So. Um, Yes, there would have been a freedom of speech. It, pre, it existed before, but there would be no constitutional positive law saying that Congress can't diminish it. And as, as I understand the way, pre, uh, the way rights were enforced uh, in, uh, prior to a written constitution, a written constitution gives, uh, makes everything uh, uh, different, but as I understand it, um, the judges would be were very well aware of uh, the existence of traditional conventional rights, but they believed that the sovereign, the sovereign, the parliament, or later the legislature, uh, did would be able to abridge those rights, uh, and if it did so specifically enough and intentionally enough through positive law, uh, that it could that it could do that. What but but the reason why that is not as that's not as bad as you may think is because it's very hard for legislatures to be specific enough and intentional enough to get through judges, right? Uh, and so what judges would do is that they would give statutes narrowing constructions under the polite fiction that probably Parliament didn't really intend to abrogate these traditional conventional rights. And so the rights would get a kind of protection, uh, but, uh, but not in the teeth of an intentional uh, a parliamentary act. Um, you see the best description of this. Blackstone has a passage in which he talks about equitable interpretation, and this is part of what he's, uh, uh, what he's referring to. Uh, in that, and, and uh, the most famous case on this side of the Atlantic involving that was uh, Rutgers against Waddington, uh, which was, a, I believe, a 1785 case. Uh, uh, Professor Wood has a great discussion of Rutgers in his uh, uh, Creation of the American Republic uh, uh, book, and, and this had to do with anti-Tory legislation uh, in, the, in the wake of the Revolution, and uh, the court held that even though this New York statute looks like it's uh, violating, you know, the traditional established property rights of some of some of the English uh, during uh, the war, surely the legislature didn't mean that, and we're going to give it a narrowing construction. And uh, uh, but the court goes out of its way to say we're not saying that the courts are superior to the legislature. If the legislature really does positively enact this law, that is, put it into positive law, well, then it would govern. But uh, in the meantime, uh, the court uh, got its way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Judge. Thank you. Oh, 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 let me just say one more thing. I, I don't know that anyone else in America believes this, but I think that this is what the Ninth Amendment is actually about. 
when it's when the Ninth Amendment says that uh, that the un, that the rights that are not enumerated are not disparaged. What I think that means is that they have exactly the same legal status they would have had before we had a written Bill of Rights, and I think that means Blackstonian equitable uh, interpretation, which is a sort of middle ground where uh, uh, the legislature gets the final word, but the courts exercise a lot of power in the meantime. Exactly. Uh, and so that would mean that if, for example, the, uh, uh, the courts would were to say uh, uh, that um, uh, one of the modern substantive due process cases, like uh, birth control or abortion or whatever, the court might well say, we think that that's a natural right, a traditional right of some sort, uh, uh, and we're going to protect it. But then if the legislature comes back and says, no, we really do mean that we're going to punish sodomizers, right? Uh, then, well, okay. But legislatures often don't do that. Uh. Hi. Um, in, in one of the earlier sl slides where you underlined the word the before uh, freedom of speech, you mentioned that uh, it is, um, that this the is helping us understand that there exists such a thing, and there is a there is a uh, there is an understanding of the no, the concept of uh, freedom of speech, and that the uh, the, uh, the word there there is trying to sort of uh, remind us uh, remind us of that and sh and show that there exists such a thing, but again we see that in the Ninth Amendment the word there is referring to unenumerated rights, the rights that are uh, not defined, the rights that we don't understand. So it's quite an abstract notion, right? Uh, what if it is the, the word "the" in the First Amendment doesn't really uh, try to address the traditional understanding of what is uh, speech, but rather an abstract notion that should be uh, approached abstractly rather than traditionally? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't prove that that isn't so. It does seem to me that the use of the definite article is suggestive that it's not meant as an abstraction. That I think if I were if I were writing. Uh, an amendment about the abstract idea of freedom of speech, I would say Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. I think the existence of the the does concretize it, but you know I haven't proven that, and uh, uh, and th there I think I mean, there's some reasons in constitutional or jurisprudential theory why some people would prefer a more abstract. Uh, uh, idea now, I think it's the same for the ninth. We have exactly the same parallel for the Ninth Amendment. Is are these rights which are retained by the people? Note that retained is also it's like a bridge in that it uh, the 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 verb there does suggest a looking back uh, and a preservationist kind of mentality rather than a rather than a. a, a Come bringing new things into uh, existence. It also, as you point out, has the definite article. But there again, uh, are we talking about abstract rights that we might have, that we think sort of philosophically we should have, that we've, do we, do we reason along the lines of to be a fully flourishing human being, we need certain uh, rights? Or do we ask the question, what are the rights that people in the English world recognize? Uh, Exercised, uh, maybe they weren't defined as rights. That they are just con they're in the common law, or they're in the interstices of where there is no law. This is partly why the lapsing of the of the pre of the licensing act I think is interesting, because there's never a statute that passes pass that says you have the freedom of the press. There's only a statute passed that says we're not going to license the press anymore, and so it's actually the it's the silence or the interstices of the law where freedom uh, uh, exists. Um, but you are absolutely right that it could be an abstraction, in which case we would have a more philosophically rather than a more historically uh, oriented approach to uh, constitutional rights jurisprudence. Okay. Let's have these last three <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the phrase free exercise of religion, particularly because um, a number of state bills of rights at the founding talked about freedom of worship rather than free exercise of religion. 
And I did a survey of state bills of rights in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratif ratified, and uh, almost every state protected freedom of worship in its state bill of rights, but not the free exercise of religion. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on why the word exercise was used rather than freedom of worship. Freedom of worship seems to me as if it could potentially be a narrower right than exercise. Uh, freedom of worship might encompass ceremonies of worship and forms of worship, but not necessarily all the things that are encompassed by exercise. Um, I mean, I think that's exactly right. Uh, and if, if my memory serves me, I think it's about two to one worship versus exercise among the state constitutions at the time of the founding. Now, I don't know about at the time of the 14th Amendment. Uh, your work uh, uh, is, is you know, about all I know on that, except that Kurt Lash also did uh, an article ent entitled what the second adoption of the free exercise clause, and I thought he, or maybe it's this, maybe it's establishment where he where he says that that most of the state constitutions by the time of uh, of the Fourteenth Amendment mimicked the language of the uh, of the federal. I, th um, I think two thirds of the state constitutions in 1868 had establishment clauses in them. Right. And that, and they often say respecting, which is so peculiar because it's you know the, the state. I mean, if it's a federalism provision, it makes no sense. So what Kurt Lash argues is that by the time the last state establishment goes in 1832, and he argues that by the time of the 14th Amendment, people have kind of forgotten that because just like free exercise was everywhere back in 1789, but establishment was controversial. By the time of the 14th Amendment, disestablishment is not controversial. It's everywhere, and they begin to sort of, they, they forget that the language had its or original meaning. But as to exercise and worship, I can think of no explanation other than that they intended the broader uh, interpretation. To, to think about this more fully, we also need to look at the language of the alternative drafts in the first Congress where worship is not used in any of them, but the word conscience is. And so um, at various points in the Senate, they're considering three different versions of what we would now call the free exercise clause. Uh, they consider free exercise of religion. They say freedom of conscience. And then one of the versions actually has them both, freedom of conscience and free exercise of religion, which tells me at least that they didn't think that they were synonyms. And they debate between them, they adopt one, they think about it, they adopt another, and they end up with exercise of religion, which I think is broader than conscience, I mean, it's narrower than conscience in most respects, but broader in some others because there are exercises of religion which are ceremonial and not really conscience-driven. I mean, I, think, I don't think people wear yarmulkes because they're conscience I mean, because of some sort of deep moral impulse, it's actually a ceremonial act of respect to God, which is, I think, maybe not comprehended in the word conscience. It's broader in some respects, narrower in others, and I think you're quite right that worship, which is the word in state constitutions, is, all, is predominantly narrower. And what the word we end up with is exercise of religion, and I'm inclined to take them at their word and, uh, and go with that. <coughs> I think it's interesting, by the way, in modern, today, uh, people who want to minimize freedom of religion frequently substitute the term freedom of worship, including some people in very high places. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, I'm wondering <clears throat> about, so in your talk we saw how the First Amendment rights, which are on their face explicitly against Congress and can be extended to the rest of the federal government with the Due Process Clause, are incorporated against the states through the Privileges or Immunities Clause because they are privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States in your view and my view and I think any sensible view it would pretty much have to be, although that could be debated. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering the is... The other side is not, not sensible. I'm, not, I'm no. persuaded, but it is, I don't oh, want you right. to think that all the evidence is on one side of that. Um, so <laughs> I'm wondering, 
sort of jumping off of Bradley's question about the Ninth Amendment mm -hmm. and your comments about equitable interpretation, would the rights that under the Ninth Amendment, in your view, judges were allowed to protect by equitable interpretation, but not by striking down a statute that very plainly wanted to destroy those rights, would they count as privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States? And if so, would they get incorporated against the states in a more absolute way through that clause? Because that, that does speak to the legislatures and tell them what they may not do. Um, I think the answer is yes. And by the time we're in a 14th Amendment world, we have thoroughly imbibed the notion of written constitutionalism and, and as, a, as an aspect of positive law. And so that's the big shift is, you know, until you make that shift, if you think of a constitution as a dis, sort of a, a, a description of your, of your system, but not as binding constitutional law, then you don't have, you, you can't go into court and cite it, right? And I think that by the 14th Amendment, we are, uh, uh, we're thoroughly there. I'm going to ask the Thank people you. coming to dinner to ask at dinner. <laughs> oh, I think, I think, and, okay, and Professor uh, Wood gets the final to, question. Well, I just wanted to ask you about the word petition, mm -hmm. which really is a leftover word from monarchy. It implies inferiority. You petition a superior. There were debates in the states on this issue. I just don't recall whether they, that the word should be instruct, not petition. You don't petition mm -hmm. a, a, your, your, your agent. You instruct your agent. So were there debates in the Congress over what, because they were in the states, the word that they wanted to use was instruct, not petition, because that came, comes from the, from the uh, Bill of Rights and the subject petitioning a superior. Yeah, this is so interesting. Um, as I read the debates in the first Congress, though they were talking about uh, both petitions and instructions, they, it's not clear to me that this was an, that these were alternative formulations. But here's something we don't even talk, think about instructions. They debated for 10 pages in Annals of Congress. They debate a, a proposal to allow the people to instruct their representatives. Ten pages, that compares with, you know, the entire free, you know, the, other than the non-religion part of the First Amendment is what, three quarters of a page, cruel and unusual punishment gets a third of a page. Uh, uh, religion is the most debated, but, uh, you know, all the others are just extra, ten pages on the right to instruct. And, and this is something that um, the anti-federalists especially are, are behind. This is real populism, right? So uh, the, the, the Madisonian federal, and this time he's with the federalists, the Madisonian ideal of government is you elect representatives who will refine and enlarge the public view. Representat representatives are not supposed to just go and vote the, uh, the desires of their constituents. They'll go, they'll deliberate, they'll think, they'll have a longer time horizon. Um, if, you, if the voters have a right to instruct you, uh, then uh, you know, it's, like, it's like government by Gallup poll. Uh, uh, but the real reason why instruction doesn't go anywhere is because there's no institutional mechanism for collecting what the instructions are going to be for the House of Representatives in any event. Uh, so, you know, who knows, you know, what, you know, assembly of ordinary citizens is going to be doing the instructing. So that, it just doesn't work. Now, the Senate could take instructions because the Senate at that time is elected by the state legislatures, not by the popular vote within the state, and the legislatures could instruct. They sure didn't want that because the states were viewed as, you know, uh, the, uh, overcoming the power of the states was a, a lot of the purpose of the, uh, of the Constitution, and to let the states uh, uh, do that would really have, uh, have, been, have been a mess from the Madisonian point of view. So I think pit, maybe petition is a pale imitation of instructions, uh, but it's one that's maybe because it's toothless is the, makes it uh, palatable to uh, 
uh, uh, to the framers. Um. I want to thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking you.